Good afternoon to you. Mark Suttoth, HurricaneTrack.com here. Happy New Year to you. It is January the 2nd, 2017, and this is the first of the off-season Hurricane Outlook and Discussion video blogs that I am going to be doing between now and May and June, at which time they will become almost a daily feature. For right now, they'll be once a week as I discuss a few of the larger players that we look at when we anticipate the upcoming hurricane season, and then a look at lower 48 weather, being on the lookout for severe weather impacts, especially in the spring, and during this time of year, since it is off-season, not hurricane season, maybe we'll get a nor'easter, a big powerful east coast storm, something that would pique my interest to get out in the field and test some things, and keep my game going, that kind of thing. You know, practice makes perfect or at least we strive for that. My voice is doing a lot better today, that's for sure, than it was this past Friday. That was horrible. And uh, not quite to 100%, but certainly better than it was. They have not updated the NOAA NESDIS map for today. Maybe the government uh, entities that do this took the day off. So we still have the 29th up here, but I just wanted to kind of point out the general look of things and what we will be watching over the next five to eight months as we approach and then get into the upcoming hurricane season, now just a little less than five months away. This is usually the biggest player, whether or not, we call this the state of the ENSO, by the way, the ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation Phenomenon, whether or not this is cold versus the norm right at where it should be, or normal or neutral, or warmer, versus the norm is what really drives what happens over here and especially down through here in the deep tropics. Right now, and this is just a few days old now, this particular map, uh, this update graphic, yeah, we're still in sort of this weak La Nina to cold neutral, you know, looking at the technical uh, standards for La Nina and El Nino, we're not really in a La Nina looking at the technical methodology, but just the surface map here shows us these anomalies. You know, there's some cold water sitting here compared to where it should be along the equator. And unless and until that changes and flips over to being warmer, then the Atlantic would be favored to be very busy next year, next season. It's already next year. See, I've already lost track of what year I'm in. But that's the idea here. So we'll keep a, a watch on this. What's really interesting to me as well as how warm the Gulf of Mexico is relative to average and the Northwest Atlantic over here. Uh, this will probably wax and wane over the coming months as high pressure fades and then builds back over the Eastern Atlantic and then we'll be keeping our eye on generally this area through here to see how warm it is. A good chunk of it now is above normal um, as we get into next year but really it matters once we get into August, September, October, as you know, and that's still several months away. But this is one of the puzzle pieces that I like to look at. And a big driver in all of this is the Southern Oscillation Index, a fancy way of describing the pressure pattern over a pretty large scale geographic area of the tropical Pacific, and specifically between Tahiti and Darwin. Darwin, of course, is in Australia. And it's a difference between the pressure of the two, and you get a reading, okay? And they had an issue here. If we look at the uh, last 30 days, it says that the 30-day average is negative 18. Now that, in and of itself, would put us into pretty solid El Nino category, because this would indicate a pressure pattern that is fostering an abnormal westerly wind burst, more than likely, and abnormal warming and other symptoms in the tropical Pacific. But this is incorrect. And before we go back and look at this data, let me show you why it is incorrect. Uh, these are the recent uh, values, the SOI values. And if we look down here on December 23rd, um, I am pretty sure that the uh, pressure there... Um, 881 millibars. Let's just start over. Where is that? I think the left side is Tahiti and then it's Darwin. That's correct. Um, there was not an 881 millibar anything in Tahiti on December 23rd or, you know, what, did a tornado pass over the observation site? 
So that's wrong. And so the difference between the two, 881 in Tahiti and 1,006 in Darwin, equals a daily SOI of negative 670. And you can see what that did for all of you that like basic math out there and how averages work. We had a 90-day average of 2.95 on the 22nd, and because of this anomaly, it dropped to negative 19. Well, all of this data through here, at least the uh, 30 and 60 or 90-day data, is bogus. It's wrong. So that explains that. So let's go back to here. We don't have to worry about these numbers as much until they go in and take that negative 670 out. But the daily contributor for today, hopefully, is accurate. And you can also throw that out as well. December was not minus 20, I assure you. Uh, the number is going to be much closer to zero, maybe just slightly negative or slightly positive, something like that, probably slightly positive. But today's value is 36.75, and that's typical of a more La Nina-type pattern if this were to stick around. It's probably not. This will also wax and wane as different air masses move across the area, low-pressure areas, high-pressure areas, the Madden-Julian oscillation, man, it's all complex and crazy. But today it's positive 36.75. So overall, no real evidence that we're headed towards an overall negative phase or really an overall positive phase strongly one way or another, which would help to foster uh, an El Nino if it was deeply negative and more of a La Nina pattern if it was deeply positive. Now, what's cool, the uh, graphic here did update I think this is the latest one. I have to go back and look at my last update. I thought it was earlier than this, but this updated on the 29th, and um, this is the subsurface map, and you can see, again, this fracturing of the cold subsurface pools, much, much less now overall. Uh, these warm anomalies showing up, but these are not intense. We're not seeing uh, anomalies over here on the right-hand side of the scale, so I'm not too concerned as of yet that we are headed towards El Nino, especially since, and yeah, I do believe that the map before this, well, you know what, let's just refresh this sucker. Why not? There we go. It's a GIF animation, and Firefox will stop on the last frame. So yeah, it was December 24th and then the 29th that, um, whoops, that we were looking at. So the 24th, you can see how it evolves over time. The cold area shrinks. You get some warming over here, but this really isn't growing that much. In fact, if you look at the last two frames, yes, you get this increase as we get into December, but then look what happens here. It, too, starts to fracture just a little bit, so I'm not too concerned that we're headed towards an El Nino just yet. And that'll be something that we watch very closely as we go through the next several months. Now, one thing that's really fascinating to me uh, is the temperature profile here. This is the actual temperatures off of the southeast United States. This is January the 1st that this map was updated, and that is the 26 degrees Celsius isotherm in the Gulf Stream, no less. But I can't recall that I've seen it that far north this late in the year or early in the year, or this, this far into winter is a better way to put it. So this is really interesting here that the Atlantic uh, over here in the western Atlantic especially, very, very, very warm. And, you know, we got to really watch this for the potential uh, for nor'easters this year. We get something coming off uh, out of the Gulf and riding up the Gulf Stream towards the benchmark up here uh, that everybody talks about uh, for powerful New England and northeast uh, blizzards. Uh, and then hurricane season, you know, once things warm back up and we warm the temperatures up here. But, boy... Almost 80 degrees here just off of Charleston and Savannah. You know, you took a boat out there to the Gulf Stream. The air temperature might be in the 50s. You can jump into that water, and it's about 80 degrees. That's amazing. It really is. Uh, and then pretty warm even, even farther up from there, uh, 25 Celsius. And there's another little island of it there. That's incredible. It really is. So this, too, will be something that we watch. Gulf of Mexico also... Wow, we looked at those anomalies. Remember what this looked like over here? All that orange sitting in there? Those are positive anomalies. Well, what does it look like in reality? Well, all of this orange color in here, and then the deeper orange over here, 
that's your 80 degree line. It has not retreated south yet. Uh, the Bay of Campeche is still warm enough to support tropical activity uh, the first day of January 2017. This is really remarkable. Now this will get chiseled away and it'll cool off eventually, but it's taking longer and longer to do so each of the last few years, <clears throat> it does seem like. So, yeah, not ready for any kind of swimming up here along the shelf water area, but come March and April, spring break time, I'm sure that will change, especially if this really holds on and we don't get any deep Arctic fronts sweeping down, clearing the Yucatan Channel. That can still happen, but wow, it is pretty remarkable, you have to admit. If you're down here in the Florida Keys in southeast Florida, the water temperatures are still just about warm enough to enjoy without a wetsuit. So let's transition over to lower 48 weather, the pattern getting a little bit more active, more colors on our patchwork of U.S. watches and warnings here. In the southeast, where the warm sector is, tornado watches, severe thunderstorm, flash flooding, you name it, uh, all along parts of the Gulf Coast and then into the heart of Dixie here. So if you have travel plans over the next couple of days along Interstates 20 and 10, 75 up through Georgia, be real careful. Eventually I-95 over here will be impacted as well. Uh, South Florida, the peninsula as a whole, in pretty good shape. And then up along the border states of Canada, some pretty active weather as the Arctic air starts to come in. In fact, it's so darn cold in northwest Montana that some of the ski resorts are closing because it is dangerously cold with the wind chills especially. You don't see that very often. And then a continuation of the fairly good news out here in the west, in the Intermountain West, California, and the Olympics of uh, Washington and Oregon from time to time, the Olympic Mountain Range, the Sierra Nevada, uh, Cascades, fairly active pattern overall that will keep bringing in periods of moisture and that is always a good thing for the areas out west. Looking at the radar as I was talking about in the southeast uh, one mass of rather yucky weather <laughs> through here boy if you're flying through this it's gonna be kinda bumpy that's for sure and then another mass of unpleasant weather moving through Alabama and into parts of Georgia there's Atlanta and then over here in the Carolinas the tidewater of Virginia just generally light rain around the Chesapeake no big issues there, so that's good. Looking at the GFS over the next seven days, this is day one, so this will be valid tomorrow. And this is the 500 millibar pattern. And I, I like to use this during the winter because it basically tells you, you know, what your temperature profile is going to be, and you're looking out for any potential storms, and there's a certain pattern that you look for deep troughiness with jet stream interaction coming in with a possible southern branch uh, coming out of uh, the subtropics down here. So let's see if we have that. First of all, it kind of looks like a Picasso painting. Kind of eye here, kind of a weird eye, and then a weird nose, yeah? Stretching the imagination a little bit, but sometimes the atmosphere can do weird things. Day three, I'm just kind of skipping ahead here. We start to sort of carve out this trough, much deeper trough over the east. Cold air pouring out of Canada, northwest flow, right down into that trough. Going to be nice and chilly uh, from the Rockies on east. General Pacific air coming in to California, Washington, and Oregon, and into the Intermountain West, as I was just talking about. And each of these little patches of energy here will bring uh, bouts of precipitation to the region. So again, that's very good. So what we're looking for, does this trough amplify and then we get some energy coming across to connect with it and phase and create a big east coast storm. Well through day five, not so much. The trough starts to de-amplify a little bit. A little piece of energy comes in across the Midwest, but just not enough of an amplification of the trough over here. Uh, no Arctic air really hanging in there to really cause any concern. And then by day seven, and the, generally the Euro model agrees with this, the energy kind of gets stretched out. You're not bundling it into one big cutoff low, riding in the base of the trough into the northeast as a big winter storm. It's just not in the cards yet. But it's only January 2nd. It's only a matter of time, right? And eventually something will happen, and I'll probably be getting out there in it to continue to test equipment, especially the surge cams, 
yes, you do have storm surge and winter storms, um, and sometimes several feet of it. Just think about it. That strong northeast flow can really pile up the ocean, and um, it's you know it's kind of like like I say uh, the wintertime version of a hurricane. But nothing yet. So so far the pattern stormy, but not too stormy. That's the best way to describe it. All right, well, that is it for me for today. Glad my voice held on much better this time. Again, these video blogs will be posted roughly once a week. Try to do them every Monday, but they will be done once per week, sometimes more if we have something to really talk about. And uh, we'll discuss all things tropics and then lower 48 weather. And then before you know it, it'll be June, and we'll be right back on topic pretty much daily with the hurricane outlook and discussion. It'll be here before you know it. It always does, doesn't it? Follow me on Twitter, at Hurricane Track, and if you're watching on YouTube and have not subscribed yet, be a subscriber on the YouTube channel and you'll get notifications when I post videos. And that comes in handy, too, during the season, because sometimes they can be several per day. During Matthew, as an example, wow, what a ride that was. All right, I'm out. I'm done for today. Have a great start to your new year. Again, thanks for being a part of our operation by watching on the other side of the screen. We do appreciate it. I and myself and the team that I work with, good group of guys I got behind me, so to speak. And we all wish you the very best as we go through 2017. I'm Mark Suttoth for HurricaneTrack.com. I'll talk to you again next week.